Hi, I'm Peter Afrasiabi. The program you're about to watch, Appellate Oral Arguments, Nuts and Bolts and Do's and Don'ts, was recorded a few years ago, but I've confirmed the content is still current and timely and reflects the current state of the law. I hope you enjoy it. Good morning and may it please the court. Peter Afrasiabi on behalf of the appellant. This court should reverse the district court's summary judgment on the copyright originality claim because the lower court used the wrong legal framework, failing to apply this court's case of X v Y, and the district court missed three critical facts that bear on and establish an issue of material fact as to originality. Hello, I'm Peter Afrasiabi. I'm a partner at 1LP, and I'm chair of the firm's appellate practice group, and I'm the co-director of the University of California at Irvine School of Law's Appellate Litigation Clinic. That intro I gave you is an ideal preferred intro for an appellate oral argument, the topic we are talking about today. In that intro, I didn't speak for maybe more than 30 seconds, but you had a very, very clear idea of exactly what happened below, what the standard of review was that would be applying, and where exactly the error was and what the issues were on appeal. That's the goal of an, of an effective oral argument. And that's what we're going to talk about, talk about today in this presentation. So, as we get going, let's look at the first slide. The first slide is audience and goals, the role of an appellate court. The most critical factor, of course, in any oral advocacy is understanding who's your audience. If I go home and have an argument with my wife and I start citing to her precedent about our prior arguments and start talking about the appropriate policy ways that we should be interpreting how we discuss things with each other, or I wordsmith words to no end, I'm going to be on the losing end of that argument. In that, in that sort of a scenario, there's a different type of advocacy at issue. If you're talking to your children, same thing. There's a staggering difference, of course, for us between trial courts and appellate courts. Trial courts exist to make facts, to find facts, to decide who wins the case, plaintiff, defendant, where's the righteousness between those parties. That's what the finder of fact is there for, and that's what the trial court is there for. That, of course, frames and develops the nature of your advocacy. And that is the nature of most appellate ad or most advocacy exercises that you engage in as a lawyer in law school. But when you're on appeal, you have a different audience. You have an audience that's focused on different issues. The appellate court is not focused on figuring out who should have won, who's the ultimate party with righteousness. The appellate court is charged with es establishing law for an entire jurisdiction of people and assessing whether, if there was an error in the case before it, was it a prejudicial error? And in so doing, it's tasked with giving deference to the lower court. This deference is seen in the standards of review. So an appellate court may well look at a set of issues and conclude, had I been the trial court, I would have come to a different conclusion. But nonetheless, I'm going to affirm because what the trial court did didn't exceed the bounds of reason. That's an example of a standard of review. This means your audience is focused on a completely different set of issues, headwinds, systemic policy issues such as deference to the trial court, respect for the trial court, a presumption of correctness. Those cardinal pillars to the appellate realm that you're in now necessarily frame the nature of your audience, what they're thinking about, what they're looking for, and this of course dictates the nature of your advocacy and what you should be saying. So we see on the slide. Your audience is going to be well-versed in the case facts and the law. They're focused on making law for a jurisdiction. They're focused on whether there was a clear error below that prejudiced someone. They're focused on the standard of review and how much deference they should be giving to this original court, given the fact that standards of review exist to mandate and demand deference to the lower court. All of this equals, as you see here, that when you get up as an appellate advocate, this is not a time to give a speech. This is not the emotional presentation that you made to, to a jury. You're involved in what is really a dynamic, rapidly shifting, ping pong discussion, a conversation, a dialogue, answering questions, needing to pivot from your answers to make your points, all in a very abbreviated amount of time. You often don't get more than 10 minutes. Sometimes you get 15. It's rare to ever get any more. And so you need to be able to Manage that dialogue, answer questions, not just from one judge who may be looking at only one issue, 
but from three judges and three different perspectives, all of whom have spent a significant amount of time working up your case with their law clerks and are ready to engage with you on your oral argument. In the next hour, we're going to get ready for you to do that. So let's turn to the next slide, oral argument. You have a three-judge panel. Of course, this is unlike your normal arguments where you have one judge. And most of the time, other than the first time you appear before the judge, perhaps, <clears throat> you know what are the hot buttons for your judge, how your judge is leaning on certain issues. You may have had similar cases before that judge before. At oral argument in the Court of Appeals, you don't know who your panel is when you write your briefs. You learn your panel sometimes a week before oral argument. Sometimes in the case, for example, if you're arguing the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals or the state courts here in California, you may only learn your audience the morning of. So you'll have three of them. You won't have one. Critical point, know whether you're talking to judges or justices. There's a funny anecdotal story about an attorney who was arguing before the Supreme Court and referred to Supreme Court justice as judge so-and-so and was corrected that in the Supreme Court, um, judges are referred to as justices. And the advocate replied, yes, judge, thank you, and kept going. Know your audience. Courts of appeal find it a little frustrating and irritating when they're referred to as judge when they're justices or vice versa, justices when they're judges. You'll have 10 to 15 minutes in general, as noted. You're going to get aggressive, detailed questioning. Part of the reason you're getting aggressive, detailed questioning is you've had three judges look at this case with law clerks, all of whom are smart, top grads from top law schools, burrowing through your case, looking how to undermine everything that you've argued for and you're arguing for to figure out if, they are, if you're in the right place and if the court's in the right place. You will be engaging with people, and it's been my universal experience, nearly 100 oral arguments I've, I've done or presided over with, with the students I, I teach. It's been my near universal experience that the panels are always fully versed in the facts and the law, fully able to engage, know what's going on, you never are showing up where you have an informational advantage over the judge. And sometimes in trial court cases, of course, with busy, busy court dockets, it, you, one has the feeling as an advocate that the trial courts may not have had as much time and they may not be aware of certain facts or law having skimmed through your materials when you get up at oral argument in a trial court case. It is unlike that in the Court of Appeals. This counsels for, for the first practice pointer. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Next slide. It's a dialogue, it's a conversation, you're answering questions, it's not a speech. The error that many advocates make when they're not used to arguing in the Court of Appeals is they show up with a little speech as if they're a politician and they've literally written up a two or three page single space document and they're ready to give a speech to the Court of Appeals. If you've done that, you're in big trouble and today we're going to learn how you can not do that. This is not a jury time to make emotional arguments and emotional, you know, high emotion pitches that you may be making to juries to try to convince them of the righteousness of your cause and get, and get your award that you want. Rather, the, the dialogue is more akin to the metaphor of being on a river. You're on a boat, you have some control over your boat, but when you hit the rapids, the river is going to kind of take you wherever it's going to take you and you don't have a lot of control even with your paddle. Once you hit some part of the river, you can paddle hard and pivot and turn and go somewhere else. That's a basic metaphor that works for a Court of Appeals argument. The Court's going to ask you questions. You may be answering a question and before you even can get back to your point, another judge asks you another question on a completely different topic or area and you're now bouncing somewhere else, hence you're engaged in a game of ping pong. But as you bounce around, you have opportunities to pivot and move your argument back to make your points. You can only do that if you're well prepared though to make those points as concisely and briefly as possible. Key, key, key point, answer questions directly, never evade. This of course is true of all advocacy in the trial courts and the Court of Appeals. But it's particularly important in the Court of Appeals where you have such limited time to make your points and every single time lawyers, in my experience I've been witnessing oral arguments, every time I watch and a lawyer does the lawyerly thing and not answer a question directly because they're nervous about the implications of simply saying yes or no and they give some long-winded answer, it invokes the ire of the court and the court says, I want a direct answer, is it yes or no? And once you've done that, you've burned up your clock with a judge who's upset at you, you've wasted time unnecessarily, and the better practice is to answer the question. If you don't like the answer and there's, an, there's a reason why the question isn't a great question, you can say yes, but that is not the issue. But if your response is to start explaining to the judge why their question isn't the right one or to start reframing the question in your terms, you will upset your panel 
They will make an example out of you in front of the court. You'll be losing your credibility and you've just blown 30 seconds, which when you only have seven, eight minutes on, on your opening oral argument portion is a massive percentage of your time to give up and to have lost some credibility. The next slide is effective arguments. What's our end goal? Our end goal is that you will be able to grab the attention quickly of the panel before you're interrupted. You'll get a small amount of time to get their attention quickly out of the gate, sort of the way I got your attention out of the gate on this program, before you get interrupted. But you're going to be interrupted. So you need to have distilled your argument to its core points to get their attention, outline the error, the, your, what your core argument is right away. Be prepared to spend most of your time answering questions and pivoting to make your points in response to the questions. This again means if you've come with a speech, you've shown up at the wrong place. Have the key points ready at your fingertips to work in as opportunities arise. You want to have record citations at your fingertips too, and we'll talk about that in terms of how you prepare your podium materials. Be ready to discuss the cases, the key cases in your appeal. You need to be ready to discuss. The court will know them in great detail. You need to know them inside out, and you need to be ready to have a genuine dialogue about the case. What were the facts of the given cases? What were the holdings? What were the dispositions? And how those are graphed onto your situation. Be ready for hypotheticals that are going to test the bounds of what you're arguing and what the ripples may be in the law for future cases. Be ready to discuss the procedural implications of the positions you're taking in terms of what it means, for example, on remand for the court to do. And ultimately, you need to stay cool under pressure. So how do you get there? Well, let's go to the next slide. The first way you get there is by maintaining your credibility. The kitchen sink approach is bad. If you show up at oral argument and you intend to argue anything and everything, and you intend to point out that the district court simply couldn't get anything right, everything the district court did was wrong, you're in a bad place out of the gate. This quote from Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson in the 1950s perfectly encapsulates cardinal principles of appellate advocacy, both for brief writing, but also for oral argument. The quote being, legal contentions like the currency depreciate through over issue. The mind of an appellate judge is habitually receptive to the suggestion that a lower court committed an error. But receptiveness declines as the number of assigned errors increases. Multiplicity hints at a lack of confidence. Multiplying assignments of error will dilute and weaken a good case and will not save a bad one. So the point here is don't just start riffing on the law. Don't get up and start arguing that the district court seemed to have just been confused couldn't get anything right, messed up on the motion to dismiss, messed up on the summary judgment, messed up on the evidence, messed up on this, messed up on that. If you do that, you will have blown your credibility instantly. When you get up at oral argument, you need to have distilled your case down to its one or two, maybe three key points upon which everything hinges as to why, if you're the appellant, for example, this case must be reversed. And if you're the appellee, why what happened below is perfectly normal and was nothing untoward. The way you do that is by, in the brief writing process, narrowing your arguments, but then working from the briefs to oral argument, distilling even further, getting to the root error that's described in a simple way. There is, of course, a 99% chance, ultimately, that you're in the court of last resort for you. The chance of going to the Supreme Court is extremely unlikely. As I've said in prior presentations, it's akin to getting struck by lightning watching this video today, really. So, you need to be there to make the key argument upon which you can win and have their attention on that key argument so that your core argument gets 10 minutes of attention as opposed to spreading yourself out over five or six arguments, none of which are going to have much traction when they have a minute each. As we move to the next slide, we're going to start driving towards being ready to stand at the podium. Preparing part one. The first part of preparing to get up at oral argument is to remember that you wrote your briefs, you spent all your time writing, drafting, then you filed them, and then you haven't thought about the case for the last year, year and a half sometimes. In the Ninth Circuit, it can take 18 months to get to oral argument from the time the briefs were filed. So my advice is as follows. Around six weeks before your scheduled oral argument date, begin the process of reviewing your briefs and the record materials. Sit down and simply spend half a day to a day reading the briefs carefully, reading the citations that you cited to in the record, looking at the record evidence, and refreshing your mind, finding those neural pathways that were there when you wrote the brief, refinding them so that you orient the case again in your mind. At the same time, 
you want to be looking at those record materials that you cited in your brief and you want to be remembering them. The interrogatory responses, the deposition quotes and what's exactly in the depositions, the key emails or documents or exhibits, whatever they may be. You want to dive back into your record, the relevant record here, and start re-reviewing these materials. Do that, get the issues in your mind, and then spend a week or two pondering them, thinking about them, going over them while you're driving, think, think about it, start talking to yourself in your car while you're driving to work about what your case was about, what the error was. And I do that for about a week or two, and then around four weeks, I sit down and I read them again. And now I start in earnest, marking up the briefs, marking up the record, starting to take notes. And you can take notes in a variety of ways, a recommended ways to simply start compiling a list of notes of what are the key points, what are the best points, what are the weak points, what are the, the relevant facts, what's the relevant case law. And you're, what you're doing is you're distilling your brief. And ultimately this process is to create, in essence, a legend or a key, a map, so to speak, of your brief. Your brief distilled everything that happened in the trial court into a 50 or 60 page document to present to the Court of Appeals. Now you need to do that again to distill this into a scant you know, 10 minute oral argument where you may not have more than a couple of minutes to speak about your case. This process needs to be done over and over and over again as you winnow down and you refine what it is you are going to say in terms of what's your core argument. The end result of this process is that, and this is the practice pointer, you should be able to state your entire argument in two minutes or less. Exactly why you should win in two minutes or less. If it sounds impossible, it's not. And if you're not able to do it in two minutes, it's because you haven't prepared enough. It can be done and it is done in two minutes all the time. From the simplest cases to the most complex cases, they have to be distilled to their common denominator in a way that's understandable and penetrable. And this happens in this review process I've described by starting to work through the briefs. One of the things that you should do as you work through the, your briefs is start marking up and tabbing your record materials. By the time I'm done with my record materials, they are tabbed. I use different color tabs for different issues. For example, blue may be our evidence, green may be theirs. I may put those on the side of the record. On the bottom, I may use red for hot issues. On the top, I may use yellow for things that concern me. Then the pages within the record materials are heavily marked up and colored and annotated and highlighted. Whatever your schemology is that you use for tracking and noting and identifying issues and marking stuff up, use it. Apply it rigorously to your record materials. By the time you get to court, your record materials should look like a mess, really. But that's a sign that you have then worked through them, prepared them, and you understand exactly what you're doing with enough detail to be able to talk clearly to the Court of Appeals about the issues. Let's go to the next slide. Driving towards being ready to stand at the podium, part two. In this process, you need to start peeling away at the facts and the law. You need to precisely know what exactly are your facts. No doubt you did a great job in your brief. You didn't spin or exaggerate the facts, but sometimes it's happened through the process of different people editing and you know, working through a brief that the briefs maybe have taken on a life of their own in terms of the facts and the law. You need to go back to them and study those facts. It's not enough to look at what the brief says the fact is and see the record site and write the record site down. Go to the record, know the facts. Start compiling a list of these key facts. Read the case law. The case law is critical because the one place that you're going to be met with judges who are there to discuss the law and the intricacies of a case and what exactly happened in a case, what exactly was the holding of a case, what exactly was some given fact in a case that caused a holding to be a certain way, the one place will be the Court of Appeals. So every appeal turns on a certain number of cases, far less than all the cases that are cited in the brief. We always oversight and there's lots of citations that aren't ultimately germane to oral argument. But those cases that sort of the pivot points of your appeal, you need to know them. And the only way you know them is by reading those cases and studying them and marking them up and annotating them and creating a schemology and an order to those cases. I often myself draw what's quite literally a sort of a map, a spectrum, a line, and I figure out the cases that are good on one side, the cases that are bad on the other, and draw a line down the middle, which is sort of equipoise, and then try to figure out exactly where I fit in on that spectrum of cases, so to speak, and how I can argue into one and argue away from the other. Everyone has a different way of doing it, but in some form or manner, you need to do that as you work with the case law. 
Also, you must update the research. Remember, a large amount of time has often passed between having done the briefing when you were doing the research and oral argument. In that amount of time, any number of cases may have come down in your jurisdiction, the Supreme Court, another circuit court of appeals, or if you're in the state court of appeals, a different state appellate district. Any number of cases may have come down which cast some sort of a shadow over your appeal, good or bad. You need to update that research. The time to update that research is definitely around a month before. If you haven't been doing it on a regular basis, certainly a month before oral argument, make sure you update the research and spend some time exhaustively looking to see if there's additional cases. If there are, under the federal rules, you can bring those cases to the Court of Appeals' attention. And you need to bring those cases to the Court of Appeals' attention. And you also need to layer into your argument now what those cases mean for you, how they impact your appeal positively or negatively. That is something that you haven't written, it won't be in your brief, but you need to be prepared to discuss it orally. And so the best way to be prepared for that is to early, early look to see if you're dealing with new law so that you can layer it into your argument and understand how to confront it and deal with it with the court. On our next slide, driving towards being ready to stand at the podium, this is part three. Here, what we're going to start talking about is what are your podium materials? When you walk up to that podium, which is small in the Court of Appeals, and you say, good morning and may it please the court, you can't take up eight inches or 12 inches or three feet of paperwork and stack it at the podium so it's above your head and they can't even see you, nor do you want to take that much material up there, and nor do you need to. You may have the material handy at counsel's table, as you should, of course, but you take a subset of materials to the podium, and if you're prepared for an appellate oral argument, you can walk up there with a very minimal amount of paper and be ready to address and answer any question about any of those facts in your four feet of record and any of the hundreds of cases. The podium materials that we'll now work through are the core materials that have distilled your argument into its essence that you will have with you. Again, they're not a printed speech. Key practice pointer here as we work through getting ready for oral argument, you must work through your materials enough to know ultimately what lines you're holding and what lines you can capitulate on. And every appeal has certain lines that you just cannot let go of. They're lines that if you give up, the Court of Appeals is going to run right over you and you're going to lose. You need to know those lines. On this slide, you can see an example of podium materials. This is the type of podium materials I ultimately take up. This isn't the only way to do it, but this I found works very well over the years. And so I wanted to show you an exemplary example, I think, of how you can have everything at your fingertips on what is really one big piece of paper. So let's take a few moments to walk through and look at this. This quite literally, without exaggeration, is a white envelope that I open up and cut open. I, you can also do it with a, with a two-sided manila folder. But what I have found works and is useful is to divide this, this sort of opened envelope into three portions. On the, on the left, we have our facts. On the right, we have the law. And in the middle are the arguments and the key points, and at the bottom is what's, what I wrote there is firewall or must say, is things we have to get out. So let's walk through this. I create many, many versions of this as I'm going through the process we've discussed about distilling the briefs down to the most important arguments that I'm going to present to the court. What are the most significant facts and where are they? Many, many versions of this will be created. You will have drafts, you will edit them, you will revise them. But when you're done, when I'm done at least, I go up to the podium and on the left I have 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever of the key facts are where I have the fact written and described and then a record citation exactly to where it is. So the first fact could have been an example of whatever may be your relevant fact, but there's a record site next to it. Volume 2 of the excerpts of record at page 10 or you know, paragraph 4, section 7, whatever it may be. But you want those facts that matter, distilled to their essence with immediate citations to the record in case the court asks so that you can give it. Now on the far right side, I have what's there captioned as law. And what I tend to do is I quite literally take those post-its as you can see and the key cases I stick there. A versus B may be one case, C versus D, obviously E versus F examples. And on that sticky, I have essentially have distilled the case down to its core. What was at issue in that relevant case law? What, was, what were the key facts, the procedural holding, 
and what was the actual holding of the case. And I do that for all the cases. The reason I do this as follows. It may seem like law school work to sit there and write out briefs on cases, but the act of constantly going back to the core case law and making sure you understand every little nuance of the case law, that act ensures that you know the cases. And what I've found over the years is that by doing that and making sure that I have the most coherent, distilled version of the case on those stickies, that is the process by which I ultimately know the cases. And so you will actually then know the cases and you won't need to look at them. The worst thing that can happen is to not be very familiar with a case and you have a stack of case law that you start rifling through, trying to find the case, and then eventually you find the case and now within this 10-page document you have to find the right portion. You can avoid all of that by going through this process and breaking the case down to its shortest form possible of what matters to you. The other benefit to that is everyone freezes, you get caught like deer in headlights, maybe you get nervous, and you get asked a question and you go case versus A versus B from the judge, oh my gosh, A versus B, what's A versus B? You just freeze. You can glance down, you'll see your note, there's A versus B, you'll be right back in it, you won't skip a beat. Same on the facts. You may get asked a fact question and you may not remember it, but you can look down and go, oh yes, those, that fact is there. This also avoids the need to engage in sort of the memorization of record sites or the, the, the core memorization of things. This is a way of knowing your case in a three-dimensional sense and genuinely understanding it. The middle section on this, on this set of podium materials, this example that one could use, is captioned at the top, arguments key points. And, and you see, this process is also one that is done over much time with writing and writing and writing to distill the argument down to its core essence. The court should reverse because, number one, on the copyright claim because blank. And it's a sentence or two sentences. Same for if it's a trademark claim, it should be reversed because blank. There's no latches because of blank. That core argument, by the time you get up to oral argument, you can have that written down there in just a couple sentences. And that is a distillation of 10, 10 pages or 15 pages or 5 pages and, and endless amounts of discourse in the briefs. But it's the genuine distillation of it that you need to do so that you are absolutely prepared for oral argument. And the way I start this process, I actually start by writing on, in, on a document in Word paragraphs of text. And my first version is always unduly long, but it's getting everything out. And then it's a question of refining and refining and refining to the point that it's distilled down to paper and I can write it out. And I actually, for my podium materials, literally handwrite them out. For me, that works better than typing. Typing may work better for you. This, though, is a very useful way to carry your material up. I found just conveniently, whether it's a manila folder or an envelope, it folds over and inside it I actually take up the cases and maybe some the district court order or some scant record materials that aren't more than an inch thick. So I have them there just in case I really do need them at the podium. Now, at the bottom, of this chart, you see firewall must says. And I always think about, in my appeal, if I just get hit out of the gate with questions, I can barely get my name out. And it's happened before. Sometimes you get up, you say, may it please the court, the court should reverse, and the court interrupts you. And you're just off with questions. And they're asking you all the questions that you don't want to answer, that maybe you have to answer, that you think are irrelevant, and you're not able get to get to the one or two points that you want to make. Well. This, this is a firewall because I write that there because if you're taken down like that on a road where you're just getting battered with questions from everyone, it is very easy in six, seven, eight minutes to never be able to make your point and to frankly, in the frenetic nature of that, of that dialogue, to even forget the two points. And so I write them down there, a, a fantastic appellate, appellate advocate I know takes them on a sticky and puts the sticky on the podium. Um, in front of her where the court obviously can't see it but places that sticky down with the materials for the same reason so that if, you are, if that is done to you, you can look at that and no matter what you just go, yes, I must say that. And if you have 10 or 15 seconds, you can get that point out at least. So it's a sort of firewall of last resort where you just are convinced that no matter what, you must say these one or two things. And sometimes they're a version of your argument. Sometimes it's simply a key point that didn't come out properly in the briefing perhaps or you know, you, it was an argument that hadn't dawned on you properly and you figured it out as you prepared for oral argument and you realize, wow, that's not in the briefs. It's not going to be heard unless I say it so that you know no matter what at all, those words must come out of your mouth. 
That's a very valuable sort of trick, trick of the trade so as to be prepared. Let's go to the next slide now, which is, again, we're driving towards being ready to stand at that podium. You've got your materials being prepared or you're in the process of preparing those materials. But what else do you do? Well, mooting, doing some moot courts is critical. Why is this important? Appellate oral advocacy requires one to practice their argument, practice taking questions and answering those questions, pivoting from questions to get to your core point, all in a very limited amount of time. You're also dealing with three judges who may be playing off each other in their dialogue towards you, who may be coming from very, very different political persuasions, who may be thinking about things that, that you've never thought about. You are best prepared to handle that full range of potential questions that you may get if you get some lawyers to moot you. And they don't have to be the lawyers that worked on the case with you who know the case inside and out. By all means, get them to ask you the questions. They may help focus you in on the really tough questions and the harder questions, but they also may often throw you the curveballs. Get someone who doesn't know anything about the case, some other lawyers in your office, a friend, get them the briefs and the materials, have them read it, and just sit down and make your argument and let them ask you questions and pepper you with questions and answer those questions in a way that works and then gets back to your main point. It's often beneficial to give it to actually to people who are not familiar with the subject matter or even the case intimately because when they read the briefs and they come to you and ask you questions, they may well approach it as any, as any judge may, who's, which judge may not have come from your background. So for example, if I'm arguing a copyright appeal in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, if I get a judge who had previously been a federal criminal prosecutor, the judge may never have really touched copyright. And so may have a whole host of questions that I wouldn't have thought would come because they're not really within the brief or they raise things that are outside the briefs or what you would normally expect given the nature of the subject matter. But those questions have to be answered in a dipl diplomatic, dig dignified, and polite and appropriate way so that you can continue making your points. And those kinds of left field questions you may well get when you ask friends of yours who aren't experts in your area to read your briefs and do a moot court. Moot court, there is no substitute for it and it's one of the things that is really critical. The more you do of it for your given case, the better your oral argument will be on the day. Now, one place to look for help mooting is local law schools. Law schools often, their moot court boards, their third year law students are in clinic classes. They're often willing and able to provide resources where the students and or even some of the faculty members will be willing to take your briefs and over a lunch hour, do a moot court with you and kind of give you some feedback. That's an incredibly valuable way to do it. To start refining and focusing your argument, you get the feedback from people about arguments that work, arguments that don't. Even in, it gets down to the nitty gritty to the level, for example, of when you're answering a question and you say clearly this or clearly that, you get reminded, let's not use that word, use a different word because certain words like clearly can be triggered to a court to say clearly or always, like how can it always be always? And now you're, you're, you've been taken out onto some sub-issue if you, know, you said this is always the case and you've now begged a judge to test you on that hypothetical and you lose a minute unnecessarily because you don't even need to say always to win your case. Those little things get sorted out through the process of doing moot courts. Now, the final point on this slide is to argue the other side. If you have enough time and the resources to prepare, at some point, Generally around two, three weeks before oral argument, you'll have been doing some moot courts, you'll be getting ready, you're driving to work, doing your argument, saying it, asking yourself questions and thinking about exactly how you answer them. But one incredibly valuable thing to do is to pick up the other side. So if you're the appellant, go to the respondent's brief, go to the other side's argument and really sit down and make the best argument you can for them as an oral advocate. What would you argue? What would you say? Get into their skin. Don't just spend your time discounting their argument and, and thinking your argument's better, saying that it's better, believing that it's better, drinking the Kool-Aid too much, or assuming that the points they're making aren't very good. If you really spend the time, and it doesn't take long, if you spend a few hours really studying their brief, thinking about what you would say as an advocate if you were on the other side, and getting up in a moot court and actually doing the other side's argument, that will illuminate for you many of the weaknesses in your case. It may illuminate how you frame things and how you, it, you talk about your issues in your case law. 
and it will also stop you from drinking the Kool-Aid when you get up at oral argument. This also has some additional benefits that it can refocus and reframe your opening part of your presentation and also give you some insight into where you may be on your, the rebuttal part of your oral argument. Ultimately, what this does is this allows you to focus on the weakest points of your case and be able to take those questions and answer them. One of the errors that's made by, appellate, uh, by attorneys arguing appeals is they focus only on their strongest points, which we all as advocates want to do. I want to make my strongest points and I hope the court not, is not going to ask me my weakest points. But the weakest points have to be addressed, defended, and taken head on. And they need to be done in advance, in preparation, so that you can field questions, deal with them, and find ways to address them in ways that can become as beneficial to you as possible. Often you can take a sword and turn it into a shield. <clears throat> the only way you do that is by working through your weakest points and not sticking your head in the sand, which is often the tendency of many of us on the weak parts of our case to sort of duck and weave and just avoid them and will them away. You can't will them away when three judges have had multiple law clerks all getting ready to bear down on you on that day. So the fifth slide, <clears throat> being ready to be at that podium on the day in question. What you should do is go to the court before the day in question. There's a few reasons to do this. Number one is you want to make sure you're aware of the, the different customs of, of the court. Certain state courts of appeal, for example, require that when you've been admitted, for example, pro hoc vice, that the local lawyer introduce you to the court and you know, tee you up, so to speak. You want to know that so that you're aware. You want to make sure that you know if you're talking to justices or judges so that you use the right vernacular. You want to see the different customs of the court in terms of where you check in. You know, is it with the clerk? Is it with someone outside? Is it in the courtroom? Is it outside the courtroom? And, and, and how the whole procedure works. That has value, of course, as it does in any court. The other reason you want to go to the court is you want to go to the court. Ideally, you're not the first case in the first week of oral arguments. Ideally, other people have to argue before your panel of judges, either the, in the cases before you or in the days before you. The value in going on those is to get a sense of your panel. What are they like? How are they handling different lawyers' demeanor, questions? What do they do when lawyers interrupt and get in trouble? Um, how do they treat people in your types of cases? Maybe they have similar cases. All of that has great value in getting you prepared and, and, and giving you as much intelligence as humanly possible about your judge that you'll be arguing before. And remember, in the trial court, you have this intelligence because you're there all the time or your partners are and it's easy to gain the intelligence. For these judges, it's harder because you don't know who your panel will be until you know, a week before sometimes. Sometimes I even go a month before um, and I certainly have my students in my clinic go a month before to watch a series of oral arguments just to get a sense of the tone and tenor of that court. Some courts are by custom much more aggressive, some courts are far more polite, some courts are very easygoing, some are, some are more stringent. You just want to get a sense of, of, your, of, the, of where you are, what the zone is, and you develop practically a comfort for being in that physical space for when your day in question comes. The next slide is, what are your first words? How do you grab that attention quickly to get your point across? And that slide is a sort of distillation of how we opened this, this MCLE presentation today. You get up and say, good morning, may it please the court. And that's generally a phrase, the may it please the court, that's used in all the courts of appeal. And it's a statement that we don't normally make in the trial courts, obviously. But it is part of the custom and vernacular of the court of appeals. And that's, again, a reason, valuable reason for going to know that. But you give your name and then explain why the court should reverse. This is, of course, assuming that one is the appellant, this slide, as, is, as are many of these slides. But you explain why. And you look at this explanation here and we see we're arguing for reversal, we're arguing for the remedy that the claim needs to be put back. We've cited the, the, the governing standard of review where we say there were fact issues. That's obviously, you know, legal shorthand for summary judgment. On originality, we've identified the legal issue. And we've even identified the core ultimate root argument as to why there were fact issues on originality because it was a given declaration that said something. This gets you to the point right away. What you don't want to do is walk in and say, the law of copyright requires to have a copyright that the work be both original and fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Originality is found in the US code and under the US case law from the Supreme Court, such as. That type of long windup 
is describing to the court the law, which the court already knows. They're there with you. They know the law as well or better than you. And all you're doing is wasting time, wasting their time, and ultimately irritating them if you're giving them a sort of a law student's lecture on what the law is to the court. What you need to do is get right down to the application of the law to your case. And the way you do that, and a great shorthand trick to get there, is to think about starting with this court should reverse because. You figure out what comes after you, the word because for your case. But once you've figured that out, and you can say that in a sentence or two, you are now at the core of your argument. And that's how you get there. That's why I like to start there, because it frames instantly for the court where we're going and what the crux of this appeal is. Our next slide is an actual oral argument. This is an oral argument. We're going to listen to a couple portions of it. And it's designed to look at how one stays cool under pressure, how one answers questions directly, and how an advocate knows what the lines are that they absolutely have to hold. This case is a case entitled United States versus Black. It's out of the Seventh Cir Circuit. It was argued in 2010. And it was argued by a, a very good appellate advocate from the law firm of Gibson Dunn, who is in their DC office. And it's a case that was on return from the US Supreme Court. Um, US v. Black was one of the securities fraud, honest services cases coming out of the um, financial scandals of the, of the early 2000s dealing with the honest services law. This case had been up to the US Supreme Court and then was sent back to the Seventh Circuit on remand to deal with the nature of you know, whether honest services are, you know, and the obligation of honest services are a basis for a criminal prosecution. The link here is for you so that you can go listen to the whole argument if you want later. But we are going to listen to two portions, and then I will have a discussion with you about those two portions in terms of really seeing the value here in good advocacy in learning some of these advocacy lessons. So let's listen to this first portion, which is about a minute and 45 seconds. Our case uh, for argument, United States versus Black, Mr. Estrada. Thank you, Judge Posner, and may it please the court. Everything that matters in this case has changed since 2008. The error is now conceded, or at least indisputable. The burden is on the government, and this is not a sufficiency of the evidence case. The government today must confront the entire record, not merely the parts of the record it likes. You must deal with David Rattler. You must deal with the text of the charging instrument, the information that went into the jury. Um, you must deal with the jury instructions. And importantly, you must also deal with the acquittal. It is our submission today that none of the fraud or obstruction convictions can survive that type of examination. Now, let me uh, say quickly uh, on the fraud. Uh, it is important to keep in mind that the government expressly argued to the district judge for the theory of honest services as a basis for letting the case go to the jury in the first place. That's record at 717. There is a quotation that we have in our reply on the rule at 54 um, at footnote 3, page 10. Um, the government, after the jury came back, on the exact same basis, once again argued to the district court. This is a record 904, uh, pages 9 to 10, um, that the, the, the jury could have found the defendant guilty even if it believed the money was theirs based on the honest services theory. Now, the government in its briefing... As we heard in that clip, you saw the introduction by the appellate advocate, which clearly identified what the issue was, what the error was, even with a citation to the record. That may have been for a variety of reasons. You don't always have to cite to the exact factual place in the record. But what often happens in the process of going from the briefs to the preparation for oral argument is it becomes clearer and clearer as you work through that certain documents in the record really are critical. And maybe you didn't highlight them in the brief enough. I'm not saying that happened here, but it may have been. And it's often a reason why you immediately out of the gate identify to the court why you win because of a document that's in a record at a certain place which maybe wasn't profiled enough in your brief. Either way, this was a great example of an intro that got the issue framed for the appellate court as to where the error was. And you as a listener, not knowing much more about the case than I gave you in terms of it being an honest services appeal in the Seventh Circuit dealing generally with securities fraud, 
that minute and a half clip you heard oriented you enough that just as a lawyer with a rudimentary understanding of those issues, you were able to understand what the argument was and where, and where it was going and why there was an allegation of error in the decision below by the trial court. So the other thing that's interesting to note here is that he had ample time to make his point. He wasn't interrupted immediately. Sometimes you get interrupted much faster than that, but often courts give you a minute, minute and a half to, to, to make a point before they decide to take over the masthead. And on this next clip we're going to listen to for six minutes, you will hear just that, and we will come back after the six minute clip with a discussion of the different issues that occurred during, during this, this give and take between the judge and the advocate. Well, let me ask you about the form and Paxson <coughs> sales. Because uh, your brief is puzzling. You, you say, I'm looking at page 10 of your, you know, the most recent filing. And you say um, uh, that you haven't argued that the $600,000 in those uh, payments um, were recharacterized management fees. Well, if there weren't, why, why, how could the jury have convicted except by thinking that this was, um, this was, this was a theft, right? There's no, there's no non-compete agreement. They just get the $600,000, so. Well, I think that that is. Right? There's no agreement. You had no agreement, right? Um, there was no agreement that was signed. No agreement, yeah. <laughs> no agreement. Well, they get it anyway. And so how, how would the jury, what would, what, what's the theory on which the jury would convict, but only, uh, but only on basis of honest services fraud? Sure. I mean, that is actually pretty. When you get six hundred thousand dollars and you don't have any agreement that entitles you to it. That's, that looks Posner, like old-fashioned fraud. I mean, Posner, uh, no, it isn't. Actually, you know, the clients are as innocent of that as they are in the other what? counts. But let me just sort of point out. What do you mean innocent? Look, they were convicted of that, right? So uh, what do you mean by a, innocent? In a trial in which the jury was permitted to find them guilty of something. That yes, but I don't understand. How could they have found honest services fraud but not theft with regard to that 600000 Because the issue on that count, Justice uh, uh, Posner, was not uh, whether these were management fees. We never contended that's that they right. were. That's right. That's right. The issue was the intent to defraud. And the fact that the, comp that the non-competition agreement had been approved by the board and the executive committee. But look, if there's no intent to defraud, they can't be convicted of anything. Well, they cannot be convicted of anything, but here the jury was... So the jury option. must have found that there was an intent to defraud. And the intent to defraud means taking $600,000 and put it in your pocket without having any right to it, without having any contractual right or any other right. That was certainly one of the options the jury had. No, that's no. the only option, no. because look... If they find no intent to defraud, they can't convict of either honest services fraud or monetary fraud. So they must have found intent to defraud. And the only intent to defraud that I can see would be taking the $600,000. I understand what the argument that you're outlining is. If I could be permitted three sentences to actually respond to it, I really would appreciate it. Um, the issue here was... Those were approved by the executive committee and the board. That's what you say. Now, if they were approved, then there isn't any basis for uh, honest services fraud. Well, there was a basis for the jury to conclude that the absence of procedural regularity, the actual drafting of the agreements, even though they were intended to be there, um, they, uh, that, that the failure to draft them and sign them... No, that sign. doesn't make any sense. But it does if you consider that the jury acquitted on counts two and three the identical transactions based on the same testimony where the uh, buyers from Fora and Case... They weren't the identical. Buyer. What, the other form in Paxson? No, they had agreements in those cases. Well, right, but the government... Well, right, that's a big difference. Like, they get the money, there's no agreement. The other cases, is, they're agreements. Well, that is a difference. Uh, Judge Posner, but it's also the case that the testimony that the government proffered to the jury to underlie both counts was that the buyers never wanted either. And if the jury had not been skeptical of the testimony of the government, then it could not possibly have acquitted. Uh, on this stage, we, we are entitled 
not to have the evidence looked at in the light most favorable to the government, but to assess under Chapman and Yates versus Everett whether there is a reasonable... The question is, what would a reasonable jury have done, right? And a reasonable jury could not have convicted them on, on this 600,000, I don't think, on the basis of honest services fraud. It could only be on the basis of simple theft. I think that is not consistent with the instructions that the jury was given, Judge Posner. We're not talking about instructions because instructional error is not conclusive. If no reasonable jury could have acquit, could have found them guilty of honest services, if the, if all, if a reasonable jury could only have found guilt of theft, then the instructional error drops out. But you could only come to that conclusion by giving the government the benefit of inferences, which at this stage is, it is not... I don't see that. It seems to me this is a very simple issue. Either they, there was no agreement, but they get the 600,000. Either they did that because, because it was just some oversight, that's your argument. Someone forgot to draft the agreement. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that it is, it is a fraud. And the jury, in finding it was a fraud, rejected your accident theory. And I don't know what, I don't know what else there is to say about that. One of the flaws in that line of reasoning, Judge Posner, happens to be that it presumes that in order for the defendants to win, these theories have to be tendered to the jury as fully exclusive. You're going back to instructional error. Wow. You heard those six minutes and that was a lot of back and forth. There are some excellent, excellent examples in those six minutes of how the appellate advocate did a fantastic job in a very, very difficult environment. That first clip made you think, wow, he's moving along. It's going to be okay. He gets to make his points. But once the judge picked up, and here it was Judge Posner in the Seventh Circuit, once he picked up and started talking, you saw the advocate in a very difficult situation. Instantly, it was clear from the questions that you had a judge that was hostile to your position. Now, often what may seem like hostile questions aren't necessarily hostile, and they're just framed in certain ways, and the judge may not have decided against you already. Sometimes they're hostile. These ones were clearly hostile and were pushing. The other difficulty that you saw for the advocate was that the judge would ask a very, very long question, and the advocate answered or began answering the question, but was then interrupted instantly with another question, and he tried to answer and was interrupted again. This went on a lot, and as you saw each time, the advocate did one thing that's excellent and that's an imperative in terms of a practical pointer tip. He didn't interrupt the judge. No matter how frustrating it is to get a question, start answering it, and be interrupted with another question, and that happened two, three, four times to the point that he had been unable to answer any of the questions, and he was starting to feel probably a bit like a potted plant in the whole thing. As frustrating as that is, you stay cool under pressure, and he stayed cool. He didn't interrupt the judge back. Had he interrupted the judge, he would have given the judge the ability to say, I'm the judge, don't interrupt me, counsel, what are you doing, that's not how we argue, and then he'd be slapped over the head and lose more time on his clock, one of the do's and don'ts issues that we've already talked about. So he kept his cool, kept his cool as long as he could, answering, trying, being interrupted. Then you saw, and it's really very good, at 3 minutes and 49 seconds, if you go back and listen to that clip and, and stop it around the 3 minute and 49 second mark, the judge asked a question that was a critical question about the nature of that appeal, and the lawyer knew what his line in the sand was, what that firewall was from our podium materials that we talked about earlier. And he answered politely but firmly to the judge, no it isn't, you're wrong judge. It's polite, it's firm, but it's absolute. And advocates can often, especially in a court of appeals where you haven't been there before, you have three judges, particularly if you're before a judge like Judge Posner who's very famous and well known, it can be easy for an advocate, a young advocate, an inexperienced appellate advocate to be run over. And the nature of the questioning can be so hostile that you just capitulate your lines and you just allow the steamroll to happen. Then you've given up your appeal on a different basis and it's easy to sort of, for the court to discard of, of your case and you may even have problems with your client and your carrier. You have to know where your lines are and you have to be willing to stand up firmly to the judge and say, no, you're wrong, judge, that's not correct, let me explain why. He was excellent at doing that and you saw an example of that. You also saw a few seconds later, and around, around four minutes and 13 seconds, 
a very, very qu direct question with a very direct answer. It wasn't the lawyerly circular language answer to try to evade the question and redefine the question and answer the redefined question. It was very direct and then it was going to be explained as to why the answer was what it was and why the question wasn't necessarily the correct question to frame for the Court of Appeals. And you saw there what was interesting is the lawyer was again interrupted. So you had more interruptions. This goes on for about another minute where question, the lawyer's interrupted, and the lawyer is unable to answer. And then eventually the lawyer said something that you may have caught that's a very, very useful way to respond when you're in a difficult situation and you simply can't <clears throat> say anything. You're being asked questions, but you're not even being allowed to answer the question because the judge is on to the next thing and the judge is sort of now speaking and himself giving a bit of a speech or, or sort of a free-flowing dialogue. The lawyer said, Your Honor, if I may have three sentences to respond, I will answer that question. And then he started speaking to give his three sentences to answer. That was a fantastic way of being firm but polite to the court and letting the court know, I can answer that, but I do need a few sentences. Please don't interrupt me. It was polite, it was firm, it wasn't rude, and it was a very, very useful way to key the court in to allow him to make his core argument. And the advocate knew all he needed was three sentences, and he could make the argument and explain the point. And he knew he could do it in those three sentences because he had prepared, as we discussed early, earlier in our um, preparing to be at the podium segment of this presentation. As you noted, as a, as a footnote, he got one sentence out and was interrupted again and, and on it went. But he made his point and he was polite and diplomatic and he was never rude and he answered directly. So those two snippets are two very, very good examples from that case of a fantastic appellate advocate handling a very difficult court staying cool under pressure, answering directly, and knowing absolutely where the lines are. Some of the golden rules throughout this presentation we've been talking about. Our next slide is, what is your closing point you're going to make to the court? You need to be very, very clear as to what is the outcome you want? What's the disposition you want? All too often, after having made your full argument, lawyers say, we ask the court to reverse and we submit unless there are any further questions. And it's too thin a basis upon which to end your conclusion of your oral argument. You want to wrap it up into something a little bit more that ties into your, your opening remarks and ties into your core argument, where you say this court should therefore reverse because, and you, re you reiterate or restate your key point, or maybe you haven't had a chance to make your key point, and now's your point. The other aspect of this is you need to be very, very clear about what you want the court to do. You don't want to simply say the court should reverse and send it back in some vague, unclear fashion. If you want the case sent back because of an error and something needs to be re redone again, you should be prepared, you must be prepared to explain to the court what exactly should be those directions on remand. Is the court directing the case back to the administrative agency to take new evidence? to reconsider witness testimony, or is it being sent back to be re-reviewed on the cold record as it was? All of those can have very, very different outcomes for you in your case, and you wanna be alert to them, key to them, alert the court to them, so that when the case bounces back, if you win, and assuming you're the appellant in this hypothetical, of course, if you win, the case on remand doesn't leave the trial judge frustrated because the child, trial judge has no idea what to do because it just got told reversed and he, everyone now has to figure out what that means. So it's your opportunity to be very, very clear. And more often than not, when you say the court should reverse, you will get a judge who says, what exactly do you mean by that? So you wanna be ready for this exact disposition in terms, of, in terms of what you want the court to do. Let's now look at this next slide are our top seven golden rules and this is in some sense, the distillation of this, of this entire presentation in terms of the seven most important rules that you need to live by, the golden rules for your effective appellate advocacy experience. Number one, get to the point instantly. No long wind-ups like we discussed. You must be at that point instantly. And if you're not able to get to the point in instantly and state the crux of your argument and why you should win instantly, then you haven't prepared enough. So prepare and you'll be able to get to the point instantly. Number two, answer directly. Again, evasive lawyering is the most frustrating thing for appellate judges, and when you witness it, it does nothing but damage your case and your credibility. Answer directly. If the answer is an answer that's bad for you because of the nature of the question, 
answer it directly and honestly. You maintain your credibility and your honesty is appreciated. And then you can explain why it doesn't matter the way you answered you did because the nature of the question may not have captured something that matters. But give that answer first. Number three, you have to know your record and the case law backwards and forwards, inside and out. I mean, you really have to understand your material in this three-dimensional sense. You will be there if you have ultimately prepared the podium materials along the lines I showed you or some version of that because that process of preparing the materials forces you to know your facts and your law. And this again is one, it bears repeating, this is one audience where knowing your facts and law inside out back to front is critical because they, more than any trial court, given the staggering pressures in the trial court, the appellate court will know every nook and cranny of your record more than the trial court ever may. So if you're going to be caught out on a factual statement or maybe someone in the briefing gilded the lily on the facts or they too generalized the law in a, in a very general way, this is where you're going to be called out on it. You need to be prepared for it. If, it. if it's happened in the briefing, you need to be ready. Don't interrupt the judge ever, number five. And that's just simple, ever. When you're answering a question, if you get interrupted with a question, you finish talking. I know it's mid-sentence, you want to make your point, you finished, as you saw in the example of the, the US versus black case. Be ready to address weak points, number six. You're there if you do the moot court on the other side, as explained, but you have to be ready to address your weak points. You can't avoid them. And number seven, this is really critical. Avoid descending into the rabbit holes. This is another way of saying, you stay focused on your core points. You don't need to go tit for tat. The briefs are always filled with all sorts of issues or the other side may something, say something during oral, oral argument that you don't like isn't fair, but it may ultimately be irrelevant to the core issue that you're pressing. You don't need to respond to everything. Every time you descend down a rabbit hole on something that doesn't necessarily matter to your core argument, you waste time and you open potentially Pandora's box and get more questions on something that doesn't even particularly matter. <clears throat> Those are the seven golden rules. They're all built around one golden rule, of course, and they're, they're all derivatives of the, of the major rule we talked about on the very, very beginning of this, and that is you must maintain your credibility. Famous anecdote from a famous appellate advocate back east. He had picked up an appeal that his partners had written and had gone through the briefs and the record review materials in order to argue the case, and he hadn't written the appeal at all. He went through the materials and had come to the conclusion that one of the arguments pressed in the brief, you know, argument 3A, was wrong and they shouldn't have made it. He got up at oral argument and the first words out of his mouth were the court should reverse, but we withdraw argument 3A. I read it. My partners believed it was good when they wrote the brief. I don't believe it's a legitimate argument. We hereby withdraw it. It was an argument that obviously was never going to pass muster, was the conclusion he had come to. And maybe some other lawyers had drank the Kool-Aid too much and they had pressed an argument that they shouldn't have. And that goes back to one of the original points about winnowing your issues down to the right issues. What he did by doing that was instantly gain credibility with the Court of Appeals and he was able to get out of having to try to defend the indefensible in some way. And he was able to immediately take off the table what would probably be 10 minutes of eager judges with their knives out ready to carve him up on something that was just indefensible. Credibility is everything. So let's talk about the appellee argument now. The appellee argument, all the golden rules, all the tips apply, but here it's a little bit different in the sense that you're prepared, you know your key points you need to make to defend the judgment below, the decision below, but you also have to watch very, very carefully the argument of the appellant and the panel's questions and issues. Those illuminate for you a lot of where the panel is going. Often they ask questions that you will have to answer the exact same question. They even tell you expressly sometimes, or it's very, very clear that given that question, you need to be ready to answer the same question yourself. That real-time dialogue that you're witnessing really defines a lot of what you're going to say and, and when you're going to say it and how you're going to say it. So you have worked out your key points you need to make. You know the order you'd like to make them, but what you're doing while you're sitting there watching those 10 minutes happen to the other side is you're suddenly reorienting your points, the order of them perhaps, how you're going to say them and how you're going to weave in some of the answers to the questions by one of the given judges. The other thing that's critical is to always be ready and never forget the alternative bases to affirm that may not have been mentioned, but they're there in the record. And if you have an alternative basis to affirm as the appellee or the respondent, you need to be ready to say it and to pivot to it and identify it. And remember, as the appellee, you have different sort of major focal points that govern your appeal. 
you are trying to defend what happened below. So you are plugging into the concept of deference, the standard of review that may require deference. The idea that the trial judge can't be an idiot and can't have got everything wrong. Of course, the what the trial judge did is absolutely reasonable. You're plugging into the idea that what the other side is asking for could have dangerous unintended consequences that the court should be concerned about in terms of making law. Those headwinds are your headwinds that help you and they need to be woven into your argument as you get up and talk to the court. The next slide brings us to the last few minutes which is the rebuttal for the appellant. You the appellant got up, you had 10 minutes, you probably reserved one or two minutes. Um, maybe you were able to, maybe you weren't. But often, even if you weren't, the court will give you a minute if they burned off your clock, if you're lucky. And so you're watching what happened. And you're watching carefully what the questions were for the respondent. So you can in real time know you're going to get up and you're going to respond to exactly what you just saw. What you're not going to do is get up and rehash everything you already went through in your opening time and plug right back into all of that stuff. You've made those points. This is your chance to say, you asked a question of the other side. They said this. It's not correct. This is the correct answer. They argued this, it's not right for this reason. It's your chance to get the final word in on issues that are clearly of import to the panel as they handled your opposition party. And again, remember, you don't go tit for tat. If a whole bunch of things were said that are irritating or wrong and your brief addressed why they're wrong, but they're not germane to how the court is lining up these issues, don't waste your time talking about them. Go right to the two or three points. And one of the ways to do this is to get up there and say, there are three things that matter that I have to say in my rebuttal. Number one, number two, number three, and you make those points. Here's our conclusion. The do's and the don'ts, you can, you can read the tips. The key in all of these is credibility. Good luck with your appeal.